Welcome to the world famous Jiggy Jaguar radio program. Raw and uncut, Jiggy Jag, you know how you do it. You know what I'm saying? I think. Broadcasting live from Hutchinson, Kansas. Well, I'm sitting here with a linguist. I had a no idea. <laughs> I, I didn't that. know you were, but I didn't know that you were a wordsmith. <laughs> Call Jiggy right now. 267-22-Jiggy. Hey, Jiggy, what's happening, man? I'm going to be that uh, David Bowie song. Jiggy play guitar. Jeff. It's a great name, man. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Presenting. I'm, I'm Mike Massey, and, uh, you know, you can catch me on Jiggy Jag TV and uh, see a few of my tricks up there. Thank you very much. Jiggy Jaguar. I never knew what freedom was until I saw you lose yours. I don't know what he's up to. Welcome to it. It is the Big Broadcast. We are live. Coast to coast and boulder to boulder on iHeartRadio today. Get a hold of us online at GDJ.com. We are going to go to our first guest. We are going to get on Michael Butler. Michael Butler. And we will get him in here. So let's see if I can find Michael Butler. Not to be confused with Michael Schwartz. May the Schwartz be with you. We will call Michael Butler and we'll see what we can find here. So let us call Michael Butler. And we'll see if we have a, a great guest for us today. He is a best selling author, he is a former. Uh, PR man, I guess you would say. Um, and he has written an incredible new book. Michael Butler is with us today. And um, Michael, explain to me and Don and IQ a little bit about your book. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yes. Um, yeah, I was a PR guy for a while. And then um, I had written a book before I got into PR. I wrote a okay. book about a flight around the world across Russia. And then I ended up working in book PR after that book came out. Then um, after that, I did that for many years. A woman that I had done promotion for was named Vonda Pelto. She wrote a book about her time. She's a clinical psychologist. She wrote a book about her time, which I helped promote. Um, about her experience counseling or dealing with a number of real notorious serial killers at Los Angeles Men's Central Jail while they were awaiting trial or during their trial. Because okay. there was an incident where one of them killed himself and the sheriff department who ran the facility didn't want that to happen again. So... Then um, she wanted to do a second book about one particular guy named Bill Bonham. And I was then brought in to kind of help with that. It ended up being a much more involved project than I anticipated. It took us the last three years. So what we ended up with, which just came out uh, a few weeks ago, is a historical biography of a guy named Bill Bonham, who was called the Freeway Killer. And he killed 22 young boys in 10 months from wow. June 19, no, August 1979 to June 1980. And it was a famous case around that time when a lot of these types of guys were operating and, and the number of them here in Southern California, the Hillside Strangler and, uh, and, Ken Bianchi and his cousin Buono and Douglas Clark, another guy that Bonda dealt with. So we ended up writing a historical biography that's very detailed because we were given 
boxes and boxes of investigative documents by a gentleman named Gene Briscoe who worked for a public defender's office. Wow. <laughs> it is called <laughs> Without Redemption, Creation and Deeds I... of the uh, Freeway Killer Bill Bonin, His Five Accomplices and How One Who Escaped Justice. And uh, one of the co-authors, Michael Butler, joins us today. So I'll start with the great Don Mazzella. What 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 kind of questions do you have well, here for uh, for Michael? Well, my first question is: oh, You said one escaped justice. How did he do that? Well, um, what happened was now Bonin he recruited these other guys to help him. One uh, was helped him more than the others. He he did ten by himself. And he had help with the others. One guy helped him with six. Another guy helped him with two. And then this last, one of the last ones he recruited, he was very, he felt very, he was, you know, homosexual. And that's part of the reason why he killed young boys. Because he would rape them and then strangle them. He didn't torture them per se. He would beat them up. But one of the ones that he uh, did this with was very close. He felt very close to him in a kind of personal way. And those particular ones were the, at the end of the murder spree. And the evidence against this one guy, and no one knew who he was. Some of the others were interconnected. They kind of knew each other, so their identities once Bonham was arrested, became known very quickly. But this one, his identity wasn't known until much six months or more after the arrest. So Bonham essentially, through a variety of devices, covered for him and made sure that he got away. And this guy was arrested for one of them, but it was the wrong murder. Oh, wow. And, yes, and so it's in the book how Bonin then, because we have his diaries, so, and we have a lot of other historical material that we pulled from a lot of newspaper articles and some other people who were involved. And it shows, and we show how and why he covered for him. And the how is the interesting part. Because it was an involved process, which involved a lot of different moving parts in terms of Bond and telling the detective certain things, revealing certain things to help this one particular person, and, and other factors which came into play. It's a very complicated little scenario that plays out over about, you know, the, the, one of the most interesting parts of the book, actually, is the period from after Bonin's final arrest in June of 1980 until about April of 1981, which is when all the deals and all the machinations with the prosecutors and the media and the accomplices, all of those were then worked out completely. So that 10-month period, there was a lot going on, and that was one of them. And so he ended up getting, and the, and the funny part of it is the detectives had a real good idea that this guy was involved with Bonin on something. And Bonin kind of held that in front of their noses. Hmm. So it's a real interesting part of the story. Did, but there's no statute of limitation on murder. Have they ever thought no, of going after there this isn't, guy? But also, the, it's the only thing, there's no physical evidence. That, and that was the reason why they, they couldn't hold him. They had nothing physical evidence on him. And the only person who could tell them what happened was this person himself who didn't crack under pressure. He played stupid all the way down the line. <laughs> <laughs> and Bonin, who of course knew everything, and Bonin wasn't going to say a thing. 
and <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's no way. And so he was never he was let go, and never charged with anything connected with Bonin after that. <laughs> Well, uh, let me ask you the next, I guess, the, the question everybody asks, what drove, drove him to do this? Well, and that's, uh, that's, a, and that's a question that is answered throughout the book. because Now, the book is 550 pages. So this is a very detailed historical biography. And I, uh, we start from his childhood, which was difficult at best. Uh, sometimes it was good. A lot of times it wasn't. There was family abuse. He and he grew up in his, the first part of his life was in a small town in Connecticut. Family abuse, sexual abuse, father, you know, beat him, gambling, whatnot. Mm-hmm. Ended up in a boy's home, more abuse, orphanage, more. Then he ended up in Vietnam. Uh, and he served during the Tet Offensive as a helicopter gunner and wow. was decorated for saving lives. He ran out in the middle of a firefight and dragged some guy into the helicopter and saved his life. Holy smokes. Um, but also Vietnam was a telling time because it got him used to violence. And so... But there's so the much... Part, see, the book is broken into four... Four basic parts. His life until Vietnam. Then when he gets back, he gets arrested. He spends nine years in and out of mental institutions and prisons. Then he snaps and goes on the killing spree. That's part two. Part three is after his final arrest until he is given the the final death penalty verdict. And part four is from that point until he is executed. So the book is kind of four stories all intertwined within one book. But he wasn't executed, if I... Yes, he was. He was executed in 1996. Mm -hmm. He was the first uh, California uh, inmate to be uh, executed with lethal injection. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. And uh, they they loaded it up pretty good because they 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 wanted him to get that. You know? <laughs> yeah, that that is. They they were making it. It was a it was political as much as it was judicial because these this guy had made LAPD and LA Sheriff's Department look like Keystone cops. Because he was really clever in how he covered his tracks. And the only reason he got caught was because of a lucky tip. Wow. A lucky tip, did did you say? Yep. Hmm. Yep. Well, your collaborator, can you tell us a little bit more about her? Yes. Okay, Vonda... um, he grew up in a small desert town uh, here in California called Needles. Uh, later on, uh, she ended up becoming a clinical psychologist. And at the time that, this, that these things were happening, she had just gotten her Ph.D. She was a single mother supporting two kids. She just got her Ph.D. She wasn't even licensed to practice in California yet after getting her Ph.D. And... She had done some government work down in Orange County, and then one of Bonin's accomplices, uh, Vernon Butts, killed himself at L.A. Men's County Jail. And they, they lost a major witness and a major defendant in this case. And the Sheriff's Department and the med- med- Mental Health Department in L.A. County looked like it looked bad for them. So Vonda was brought in and a position that had never existed before. And Vonda was a good-looking woman. Uh, She was a young, hot thing. And they brought her in, and they gave her an office on the block (laughs) with the serial killers. And her job was she wasn't to counsel them. She wasn't to analyze them or anything. 
Her job was to chat them up, keep them on an emotional even keel so that they could get through their trial and then get shipped off somewhere else. And she did that for three years. And it, in many ways, changed her whole existence because she became very calloused, cynical. She started drinking a lot because the stress of dealing with these unrepentant people who would tell her gleefully of what they did to people. And after she quit, she was there for about, about three and a half years doing that. And after she left, she always wanted to write a book, but every time she tried to write the book, she started having nightmares and she couldn't do it. And finally, after about 15 years, she finally got the book done, which came out in 2008. And she's an interesting woman. And, uh, I've, uh, now we worked closely on this together. A lot of her stuff was already written. And then we ended up, uh, you know, I had to go through all this boxes of material that she had that she really hadn't explored some of it. A lot of it she had. So uh, interesting woman, and uh, she's, a, she's a crack up, and she's got a, you know, mouth like a longshoreman still. <laughs> What's she doing now? She's, she, we're promoting the book. She's retired. Well, what did she do uh, after leaving uh, the jail? Oh, then she just have opened her own private practice. And she did, you know, she had a shop in uh, Long Beach and South or uh, North Orange County uh, here in Southern California. And she just did private practice. And she also did some, you know, government work, uh, with some of the local law enforcement agencies and facilities, but nothing like that. Oh, and uh, she was married to an attorney who, and her husband, uh, Jim Leah, who was an accomplished attorney here in Southern California. He was vital. Uh, he passed during the pandemic, but I consulted him constantly on all the legal questions within you know, the courts, how prosecutors think, how defense attorneys think, how the court system played this, that, the other. So his advice was invaluable in getting the book uh, correct in many ways. Mm. So I Q. Al Rizzoli. Are you Rizzoli. publishing a book or, or is it from a, uh, a, a publishing company? Yeah, did you self-publish? Um, no, we, or? Just, we went for the self-publishing route through uh, Amazon. Um, we, I, I didn't have time to, to mess around. We didn't have time, you know, we got it done. We wrote it together. We edited it together. I designed it. I did everything and it came out nice and we've gotten good reactions to it. It moves. It's detailed. It is a, and you see, I, I took my notes. I read a lot of historical biographies. Some of my favorite authors, Andrew Roberts is a British historian. I've written, read 20 of his books, some of them multiple times. So I took style notes from these great British historical writers. Because I was writing a historical biography. I wanted to move, to be intense, to be fact-filled, and I wanted it to, to move right along and really get a picture. And the other thing that we had, that no other biography of Bill Bonnet had, because no one has ever seen them. We were the first to see them. We have Bonin's diaries. We have his jailhouse diaries, that, and we have all his written murder stories, which he wrote in jail. And no one had ever used them. Never, no one had ever seen them. Maybe a few of it, uh, he gave them to attorneys to hide, and they were, they'd been hidden for 40 years. Wow. And we used them in the book. And though well, I, you get a real uh, good idea, question, this guy was not stupid. I, I guess the question that everybody uh, asks uh, whenever we see talking about mass murderers is, yeah. what is the key thing that makes them a mass murderer? Well, 
Yeah, it, it, well, see, Bonin's not a mass murder. You know, there's a distinction nowadays. Mass murder is someone that well, goes multiple and murder. kills I'm 10 sorry, people right a, at a mall. No, he's I meant serial multiple killer. Murder. Serial. Yeah, he's a serial killer. Now, there were a lot of factors that came into play. He went from basically, and we, in the, basically in the material, we say we chart a psychological roadmap that charts Bonin's road from abused child to sexual predator, which is what he became, to serial killer. Now, one of the things is that one of his accomplices, Vernon Butts, who did the first one with him, is they had a strange kind of chemistry together. And on the night that they did this, they kind of, prodded each other towards doing this thing they had never done it before they had talked about it they were into uh butts was into weird occult stuff and they had talked about weird stuff before but one night in early august 1979 they were sitting there and they got to talking and they decided to do this thing and once Bonin got a taste of it, he couldn't not do it. So it was an accident in a way of fate, chemistry, opportunity, chance meeting, all of those things. He may have thought about it, but he may have never done it. We don't know. Okay. But we do know that once it happened, then it was off to the races. You know, you know, for 20 years, I wrote uh, pulp magazine crime stories for pulp magazine for 20 years. But and I always came back to, to one thing, which again, I'm going to ask you. Yes, you say that, but uh, most serial murderers that, that, we, uh, that I've seen and I've traveled a lot, uh, it, it was a power thing. The idea yes. of being, uh, having power over I, yes. Uh, is that what uh, you're saying? It's Absolutely. Actually, but, yes. Uh, Here was things? a person who had been powerless his whole life. He'd been pushed around, abused by people, and the power of it was definitely part of that mix. Definitely. And in fact, in the beginning, it was part sexual and part power. But then at some point in the middle of it, it just became all power. Okay. The 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 ability to decide. And to, to decide, decide who, life and who, death. Yeah, who does it and who does? Because some he let go. Some he picked up, and had sex with them and let them go. Some, you know, got away. The as he called them, they were the lucky ones. So, uh, but and he realized it too. He said. In the middle of it, I realized I didn't care about the sex anymore. So IQ Al Rizzoli, uh, what kind of questions here do you have for, uh, for Michael? No, it's a comment, in fact, because I've been reading and studying the subject of serial killer recently. They are very clever, in very, oh, yes. very clever, very methodical, very calculating, and the conclusion that I came to also, because they were abused, they, their victims were abused by them also. It was a power thing. It could have been Definitely. sexual and power at the same time. But they are definitely irredeemable. No question about it. They have no conscience. Yeah, and, and, and Bonin, you know, you put this guy in the right situation, he could have been an accomplished person. He was smart, he was clever. Yeah. And he, you know, he ran circles around for nine years in prison, doctors, social workers, bureaucrats, probation officers. He, he manipulated them in extreme clever, extremely clever ways. That's why he ended up getting out of prison early. He shouldn't have been let out. He shouldn't have been let out. We show in the book how the reasons why the, the justice system kind of 
fell apart on him in, in a many different ways, whether it was bureaucratic or judicial, or they just didn't see it in Bonin's manipulation. Very clever. Well, uh, Michael, before we let you go, how do we get your book and, and everything else? Okay, well, the best way, we have a terrific website. It's withoutredemption.com, easy to remember. And on every page, there's a link up to Amazon. And, it, of course, if you go straight to Amazon and put in Without Redemption and my name or Von DePelto, uh, you'll pull it right up. It's available in soft cover and in hard cover. And so far, the the people that uh, we have a few people, one of them, a, guy, a local news guy named Dave Lopez, he is in the book. He dealt with Vaughn and as much as Vaughn did, because Vaughn did, uh, he confessed to him a lot of stuff, which the newsman, he was a newsman at Channel 2 here at, at the time, CBS Local. And he couldn't go on the air with them because of a deal he made with Bonin and because of legal reasons. So he got a copy, and he's been reading it, and and he said uh, he's enjoying it. Um, so it, it's it's a difficult subject. A lot of my friends are all, why do you want to write a book like that? And, you, know, <laughs> I said, you know, I said, first of all, it was a job, for one. <laughs> Two, and then it became rather interesting, and it's probably one of the most complete serial killer biographies you're going to find out there because of the massive amount of material we had to pull from that a lot of biographers of these people don't have, especially yeah. the diaries. And the fact that Vonda met with him, knew him, conversations with him are in the book. So... All you combine all those different factors together, and you got a a very interesting type of biography of this type of person. And one of Vonda's things that she says was, "I would hope that someone would use some of this as a way to spot others who might be going down this type of road." Well, I really, I really appreciate you making time for us today. Thanks for coming Thanks. on and uh, chatting with us, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Appreciate Thank you, it. my friend. Take care. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. There he goes, the fantastic Michael Butler. Without Redemption is the latest from him. And uh, we are going to go to our next guest who joins us live here on our broadcast. He is the uh, fantastic Dr. Mark Sherwood, and uh, he's with us today here on our big broadcast. And uh, Dr. Sherwood, how are you, my friend? Man, I'm doing great. I appreciate you having me, as always. It's good to see you, man. So we have uh, Don Mazzella and our good friend IQL Rizzoli with us as well. So, um, so, Doctor, tell us a little bit about your thoughts and feelings on this uh Mar-a-Lago raid that took place uh, where they where they went and raided Trump's house, basically. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've got lots of experience um, in my previous career in law enforcement, James, of yeah. serving, uh, writing, 